I am the uh, Director of Theater School and Community Programs at Theater Horizon. I'm Erica Nagel. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement at McCarter Theater Center. And that's you. What have you heard today? Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, as these guys have mentioned, we're going to be talking about relaxed performances, but we really felt like rather than do a sort of toolkit or a how-to, those things exist and also we exist and like there are bars and we can go have mm -hmm. drinks and tell you more. Um, about those things. So we really want to use this as a framework to think about organizational institutional change. Um, and also, uh, it's actually kind of magical that we were paired with the executive leaders panel because um, the, the, the sort of conceit of, of that panel is that it needs to stop, start from the top. Um, and part of what we were experimenting with in this cohort is how can change um, rise up from uh, not executive leadership and elsewhere in the organization and permeate and shift the culture. Um, so just to get a sense about relaxed performances, are, um, can you raise your hand if you're familiar with that term? Ooh, Amazing. Good people. If, what about nice. if you're not really familiar with that term, but you've heard of like autism friendly or sensory friendly work? Great. Awesome. Have any of you done a relaxed performance or an uh, autism friendly, sensory friendly at your theater? Okay, cool. Wonderful. Interesting. Great. Great. So of those that know what it is or some somewhat familiar with it, um, would anyone be willing to give any specifics about what a um, what exactly a sensory friendly or relaxed performance is? As in what what would it look like? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? No, you go ahead. Yeah, so the, the sensory friendly, the, the elements of sensory friendly sometimes can be very specific to production, right? So these light sound kind of shifts. And what you were also getting to, Reagan, and the way that we approach this through relaxed performances is that it's a larger umbrella of shifting your organizational culture, right? It's not the sensory friendly piece is one piece of it for us, but it's really about the welcome, it's about the intentionality, and it's about creating a space that is safe, that is judgment free, and that is inclusive, intentionally inclusive. And so that's how we are approaching um, this work and when we refer to relaxed performances, sensory friendly is encompassed in that. But again, as Erica had mentioned, you can take this idea of relaxed performance as a stand-in <coughs> in ways for aspects of community engagement programming that you may be thinking on, but also keeping in your mind the, the specifics of this particular conversation. So um, we'll uh, dive right in and address some of the potential concerns or barriers that we each perceived in approaching this work. Um, so I'll start. Uh, one of the biggest barriers that we perceived, we've been doing relaxed performances, I guess we've done maybe for five years we've done about one a season. There have been a couple seasons where we've done two, but usually it's one. Um, and when we started, our biggest fear was about how much we would have to change the art. Um, we talk about ourselves as an artist-centered institution, and that's very, um, the sort of artistic quality is um, uh, central to a lot of what we do. And so that was a, a fear that we had going into it. How much are we gonna have to get rid of sound cues? Are we, like, are the actors gonna have to change, right? All that stuff. Um, and uh, we had the opportunity to partner with TDF and go see um, uh, an autism-friendly performance on Broadway. Um, and the performance that we went to see was Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. And about two minutes in, we were like, oh, we're fine. It's all going to be fine. Um, and so although that was an early fear, it was not, it, it's like so not a thing. It's, it's like one of the easiest parts. It's one of the smallest adjustments that you'll have to make. Um, the other uh, barrier that we were worried about um, was uh, I think there was some concern uh, among the, the sort of council putting this together, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, about our front of house staff and about our volunteer corps and whether they would be welcoming and judgment free and whether they could embody um, this. Uh, and again, that proved to be unfounded. We did offer them some training. We did um, uh, try to model that, but it was not, um, it, it was something that we were worried about that we just didn't have to be worried about. And we at PSF shared a lot of those same concerns. 
And additionally, because we were one of the theaters with the least experience in this work, we came in very fresh and very scared of not being able to serve the community properly. And so while other theaters in the cohort had experience with autism drama programs or previous experience with relaxed performances on some level, it was a program we wanted to institute for a long time and sort of backburnered it for a long time because we didn't have the resources or the knowledge. So uh, going in with that fear was was huge to be able to rely on our fellow cohort members to guide us through what was being expected of us, how we can serve the community, and how we can interface with them to know how, how we can welcome them better into our theater space. And a big question where people say is, what do you do? What, what is this? When we were first approached, like, you hear these phrases, relax, it sounds very heavy and, and complicated, and are we going to cause greater harm potentially? Are we responsible for being the caregivers? And of course, we're not the caregivers. We are creating a space for individuals. So a big piece of our learning was just, what is this universe? And, um, and how are we to be equipped? How, how best to equip ourselves? We were also concerned with how our subscribers and um, individuals who were um, single ticket buyers and were familiar with the culture of our organization, how might they impact the um, experience of someone else by not being receptive to it or not understanding what someone else's needs may be in that space. So we were very mindful. I would say we were concerned, but more mindful of navigating that terrain um, for our subscriber base and those who are, feel very comfortable in our space and um, are used to traditional theater etiquette. Um, we were also curious, will anyone come? <laughs> and um, what is the cost of such things? What's the impact for potential loss of revenue, the literal expenses, loss of revenue, and then is there potential income to come from this, or is it all doing it for the, the right reasons, and is it all at complete expense for us? And we learned that is not the case at all, but um, those are ours. Yeah, and, and on the part of Theater Horizon in terms of um, perceived or anticipated barriers, we didn't actually uh, have very many um, anticipated barriers for um, because for the last 10 years Theatre Horizon has already been serving this population and when I say this I mean um, specifically a, um, a the the, um, the community with autism. Um, we have an autism drama program where we run um, uh, drama classes and writing classes for both children and adults on the autism spectrum and we've um, learned within the last few years that the things that we are teaching in terms of um, empathy and, and socialization skills and communication skills can really be extrapolated towards anyone that has issues with those things. So we are now working with um, um, organizations that um, work with children and adults with all types of um, disabilities and, and differences. Um, so going into this, we were like, we got this. This is great. <laughs> um, <laughs> that um, was a bit of a mistake. Um, <laughs> this brings um, us to our strategy section. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, because um, one of the things that um, the um, we have learned um, and that we we went into this work doing was doing um, working with a consultant um, Roger Dishi and, and some others um, and doing um, and doing an all staff training um, teaching um, the staff um, which includes front of house and leadership and all of that about what um, uh, a relaxed performance is all the different iterations that it can take um, and the particular population that we're serving um, theater horizon um, did not do that full all staff training because, um, um, at least on my part, I most, we felt that most of the um, information would be redundant because none of the information was really new for us. Um, so when it came to um, you know, actually implementing that, um, I had lots of meetings with all of the departments about what we needed to do to make this happen. Um, and you know, I got no pushback whatsoever, especially from senior leadership, because it was part of our mission. It was something we already did. We were very familiar with it. Um, and it was a great expansion of, of, of what uh, we could do to serve the population we already cared about. Um, um, so I definitely had the blessing of everyone. But a blessing is slightly different than um, uh, full staff and institutional buy-in. Um, because when it came to actually driving um, the what needed to happen to make all of um, the the small pieces work, um, I was pretty much the one driving that, which makes it hard. <laughs> um, uh, which makes it hard. And we're a smaller organization than others. Um, um, we have a, a a staff which fluctuates from about ten to twelve, somewhere around there. Um, so um, so usually there was 
I was the one that had the eye on is the language correct on the on the website? Are the packets mm -hmm. created? Are the everything else and and um, making sure that was happening as opposed to um, now with now that we're in our second time um, having. Um, someone else in the company during staff meetings say, hey, the our job for relaxed performances, how is that going? Is the website, um, uh, is the language on the website great? Hey, those packets, have you, do you need any help with that? What's, what's going on there? I'm now getting um, more, um, we, have, I have a, we have accomplished the buy-in part that we did not necessarily have um, at the beginning because um, I was, um, we were able to get the um, more people of, um, of senior leadership in the room when it came to um, being at the actual relaxed performance um, and being in, in the training. So I think that one of the, the biggest strategies for um, um, gaining that buy-in is, uh, is getting people in the room. Um, and, to, and to actually see the work that's happening, as opposed to saying, we're doing this thing, these are all the things that you have to do, they have to see the impact of what's, um, what's, what's going on in the work that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that was really um, valuable about the cohort was that um, for folks that were doing this for the first time, they could go to other cohort theaters and see it and bring some of those senior leadership with them. So it doesn't necessarily, like it can be a model of like, just do it all yourself the first time, get it through, once people are in the room, they will want to help you, which is true, that will happen. Um, but also you can go see one at another theater and some of that same experience, or go to a ballet or go to an orchestra, there's lots of different ways to experience it. Um, in terms of uh, strategy at McCarter, we started um, with a very interdepartmental, um, we called it the Autism Council. Um, the first year, so before we even decided uh, whether or not we were going to do it, we had a group of people, and it was a very um, strategically gathered group. It was people who are kind of um, sort of like the second layer in departments, so people who have enough power and influence to have um, some direct influence up, but who are also like actually doing the work and are, are the worker bees and are not necessarily um, somebody who's going to um, delegate to somebody else uh, so that they're coming to the meetings creating action items that they are act that they are going to execute um, and I think that made a really big difference in terms of accountability that first year um, it was kind of organized at the time by our general manager and it was just because he had a passion for it and he wanted to do it and so he put this group together um, now it's a little bit homeless in our organization. Technically, it is overseen by patron experience, which is basically front of house um, and concessions. Uh, but the ripples from that first council are still in effect. So some of the things that were, like the education department still creates all the pre-show materials just because that's what we decided five years ago. Um, so it probably is time for us to think a little bit more strategically about who's doing what. Um, but that interdepartmental nature of it for us has been like probably the most important element of its success, that it wasn't just housed in community engagement or in education or in marketing or wherever. Um, the other thing in terms of strategy, and I don't know if this is strategy as much as it's just like a truism, is like it gets easier the more times you do it because <laughs> you start building systems that are replicable. So like you buy the bean bags the first year and then you have all your bean bags <laughs> um, and like you create the template for your um, social story or your pre-show guide and then you have that template um, and you've already taken all the pictures of your bathrooms and your lobbies and your waiting areas and you can slot in just the, the um, the show specific photos. Um, things like our front of house team the first year showed up probably three hours in advance to set up the relaxation area and the um, quiet area. Now they show up like half an hour earlier and they all know how to do it. Um, the first year we were really intense about um, having like certified autism specialists on hand in the, um, in the aisles and it, that has actually proven to not be needed and now our volunteers are able to do that and it's great if they can be there but it turned out not to be a selling point the way we thought it was for parents partly because they were like sure but you don't know my child like that's not a thing um, uh, so just things like that that like the, the as you do it and as you do it over time um, it not only becomes easier because it's a shift in culture but just literally because you already have the systems that you've built and much like Angela, I also made a sort of false promise of I got the blessing from 
from leadership and then said, I'll take care of all of it. And then it ended up being, everyone needs to help me take care of all of it. Um, <laughs> it's just the nature of the work. But uh, what was invaluable to me at PSF was being able to leverage the support of the cohort and TCG and our specialists to help make decisions. Because like Erica said, at first year, it's all decision making um, on the tiniest, tiniest levels. And so even just getting it on our calendar, and if, you know, if leadership would say, no, you can't have a weekend performance, I would say, but People's Light says weekend performances are best. Or, no, you can't have this rehearsal time. This never happened. This is an extreme situation. But no, you can't have this rehearsal time. Uh, our, our world-renowned specialist says, I need rehearsal time with my cast. So it was all these things, being able to go back to the cohort, back to people who have done programs like this, who have instituted these performances, and being able to leverage all of that support to come into my, into my organization and, and get the buy-in from everybody who also didn't exactly know how to approach the work, much like me, but having these specialists sort of as a support system was, was invaluable to us instituting these successfully in the first year. Mm -hmm. And um, as Megan mentioned, the you know it, it didn't. We have a Tuesday night. Sometimes you need to work with what you have as far as mm -hmm. capacity. If you have one night that's underperforming and it's the Tuesday evening show, that's what you have to work with. Maybe for a first year of trying something out, take that, see what what happens because um, what we were able to do as part of strategy for People's Light was then we were able to gather so much data around, okay, anybody who had an impulse to come expressed an interest in coming that didn't show up on that first Tuesday night when we offered it, what were your barriers? What would be a different mm -hmm. time when you when would be more convenient for you to attend? Well, weekends, well, matinee, great. I took all of that and said, okay, my friends in leadership with me, we need to give, if we're going to do this, this is the audience's need. And what are the other barriers? Price. What's the comfortable price point? And we've settled on um, a model where it's a half price ticket across the board for anyone, a $15 ticket for um, with a special promo code that we pump out to um, targeted um, constituencies. And that's become something within the cohort that we've been able to leverage that across other organizations. So it's like, well, our regular ticket price is usually $55. Like, but this is what the community has told mm -hmm. us. And so if we're really interested in serving them, this is what we have to make available. Because it's not just, um, it's not just one ticket. If you're thinking of bringing the whole family, if you're thinking we might have a meltdown on our way out, you also need to have a fully refundable, um, a, fully, a full refund policy is what we implemented at People's Light. And we're able to leverage that with others in the cohort to say, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. Our theater would never allow a no questions asked refund policy. It's never, never been uh, used. No one's ever asked us for it. But the comfort of knowing that it's there has allowed so many more people to try and to minimize that barrier of potential risk. So price point, time. And if there's anything that your organization that you feel like, okay, we can't negotiate that right now, gather the data, find a way to figure out what is the story we, we need to share internally to make the change happen. And you know, calendar is so significant in that. Um, Can I bounce off of that please. quickly? Uh, also, in addition to these sort of decision-making processes, what uh, Carmen was saying last night, too, about analysis, so much of this is rubber to road of just getting the things done. We also spent so much time, I think, forming very careful analysis of what we have done, what we are doing, what the results were, and, and organizing that into a sort of manifesto for mm -hmm. the entire cohort mm -hmm. of best practices and sort of what we all agreed to of that we will talk to our community before we institute uh, best practices or wh or whatever our policies are, and also policies like the full uh, refund and that kind of thing, so that we were all on the same page. And even though we're completely different organizations, large, small, different regions, some on college campuses, some closer to the city, we were still able to, to utilize these very general best practices and general policies that served the community best no matter what setting we were in as a theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Megan. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the question of, I would mentioned about how to engage our subscribers in this. Um, in the first year, we were really precious about it because we didn't know what we were doing and we're nervous. And so we were very precious and we really specifically invited those targeted constituencies that we thought might benefit from the performance and we didn't promote it heavily with our subscriber base or single ticket buyers. And immediately after that performance, we are like, oh no, we got to blast it open. Mm -hmm. Like if this is about, we don't want to, this is de-siloing. How these are um, families and, and individuals who are not oftentimes seen publicly, engaging publicly for all kinds of reasons and past harms that we ourselves are guilty of. And so it's allowing our subscribers, it's literally building community, <laughs> literally welcoming everyone in and allowing our subscribers to opt into that. It's not taking a performance saying, hey, subscriber, surprise. Here's, here's some other friends to meet. It's about how do we allow this space and welcome folks to choose 
to be a part of that, to opt in, and promoting that heavily with our subscriber base. And the way um, that we rolled out that information came in the form of kind of an unexpected PR campaign. As um, it had been mentioned from the Milwaukee Rep um, panel, er, the conversation just a moment ago, how Milwaukee Rep does a, an annual, um, at Christmas Carol, they solicit donations from the stage. We did that as well and put in there an explanation of this work, that show that you just experienced, we want to make that available and accessible to others who may not feel welcome, who may not feel that it is for them. We're making these adjustments and we are committed to this work. We we need your help to make this happen as a community. And so every day our actors got behind that message, our audiences were, were feeling this and like, oh, what, what does that mean? And you know, we consider our subscriber base to be one th this one kind of entity, and yet uh, we all have individuals in our lives for whom this kind of work could be beneficial because it's not it, it, individuals on the autism spectrum, certainly um, ADHD, um, individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia, mm -hmm. folks with very small children, anyone who would benefit from a relaxed environment. I dig that often, you know, <laughs> and it's not only a relaxed environment, it's a celebratory environment because it's a space where we're all bringing our fullest selves without apology. Mm -hmm. And that's refreshing. And that's something that is contagious in an organization as well. So um, in order to build that PR campaign and let our audiences know what exactly this was, um, part of that was that, cur that speech at the end of the show. Also, it's the beginning of the performance on the day of in the curtain speech. You set the ground rules um, right up front and being able to make, we kind of make a joke of it that it's, it's a no shush zone. Shh, nobody gets to do that. And people are like, oh, right, I got it. So if you're that audience member who might be guilty of judging someone, you're the whole audience, you're accountable to everyone because we all <laughs> heard those rules together. We know what this is and it's modeling the behavior so that this is the invitation. And so you have the power to do that in those kinds of um, windows. Um, bup, 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 bup. And we did that. Oh, yeah, Megan mentioned the listening tour. How to know what's needed. Um, the, the adage in, in the, um, the disability community of nothing about us without us. I mean, that should be everywhere prevalent in our work and community engagement. And it is so deeply true um, in, this, in this occasion that for our advisory councils, for the work, we must have the voices of individuals whom we hope to serve and benefit directly participating. They should be involved in the planning process, in previewing the shows with us, and having multiple perspectives across our organization. Um, because and all four of us will see something complete, we'll see different aspects in a performance to know elements that might want to be adjusted or things that, different invitations that could be made in ways that we can um, uh, better contextualize the show. Um, because as um, Erica mentioned, the, um, the changes that you make, actually, we're, we're hoping it's pretty minimal. You want to keep the art and the integrity of the art intact with this kind of work. And sometimes it's about the context you provide around that with social stories, with pre-show materials, so an individual can prepare themselves. It's the trigger warnings. It's letting people know, here's what you need to, to be prepared for. Here's what's coming. And however you need to, to prepare yourself for that experience, we're giving you the, the tools to know it's out there. Um, so. Yes, and then having a listening tour. That's how People's Light prepared. Our, our biggest strategy was going out to members of the community saying, hey, this is what we want to do. We don't know what we're doing. What do you think about that? What's been your experience? And some folks who had been to um, a TDF performance on Broadway were able to say, yeah, this is great that they did it, but we had to wait outside for 45 minutes before they opened the doors. They let us in at the last minute. We were, you know, cattled in there, and you have your jackets, and it's winter, and what do we do? We're all starting to eat in, and we're like, okay. So we are going to have, um, when we sell tickets, a group of individuals, you buy your party's tickets and then space on either side of you, an empty seat. Easy. You know, these are things that we can just do to allow that breathing space. And we also have sections of the house we just don't sell. And if people need to move and whatever, that's great. Um, so being listening and then acting on those strategies, making sure that you're absorbing them um, and how to keep it. Make sure your evaluations serve you. So anything you're asking, we leverage the cohort. Um, like TCG, TCG needs this grant. They need to have um, evaluative stuff from us. So executive directors of every one of our organizations, we need a statement from you about what the impact of this work has been. And so we all did that. We all created this collective manifesto together, which we were able to say to our organizations, we've adopted this. Did you know that? We've created this. We've adopted this. And this is now part of who we are, right? And everybody's able to be on board with that because they've had the training. They know where it's coming from. Um, and that was really, really, really powerful. Um, bu -bu -bu. That's what I'll say on that. Let's Bouncing off of that, too, it, confessing that that's a moving target as well. Absolutely. I, I recently had a staff member at a different conference be asked about a relaxed performance work, and he could not speak to it, which is not encouraging for me and just a signal that I need to share our story. I, I was not as lucky as Cedar Horizon to maybe get all of my leadership in the room when it was happening. Obviously, when you're in the room, like you said, it's you, you feel it. it. It's infectious, and the proof is there. You can You can't help but see it. 
but I, that's also a challenge for me, is just to be able to share my story in my organization wide enough so that everyone can speak on it no matter what setting they're in, because we need to constantly be finding our allies in this work in our organization and in the community. Um, so we're gonna wrap up talking just a little bit about some takeaways or big biggest lessons that we've learned, and then maybe we'll have time for questions. We've been talking fast, so we're trying. <laughs> <Hopefully>. um, <laughs> Apologies. Um, are we live streamed? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> so, Advice. <laughs> so um, one of our uh, biggest takeaways um, early on, but it has continued to be true is um, the, the challenge of marketing. And the first year that we did this, we were like, we're doing this show, and on this night, it's a relaxed performance. That was terrible, that was not a good way to do it. Um, we also, the first year, leaned really heavily on our community partner who had been amazing in terms of coming in and helping us see things that might be potential triggers and also things that we were like being way oversensitive about and they were like, it's actually fine. Um, they had volunteers, et cetera, but, and like all of those things, um, are in their wheelhouse and in their expertise. They are not arts marketers, and we were leaning way too heavily on them to get the word out and to reach um, their constituencies. So, um, so we shifted, and we're an organization, um, we produce and we present, and so we ended up just kind of shifting our mindset of like the relaxed performance night of the show needs to be marketed the way we do like one night with Joshua Bell. Like that's the same kind of um, resource and time and attention that it calls for. Um, we also shifted, uh, because we produce and present, um, we've had, we had a couple seasons where there sort of wasn't an appropriate show. Um, we've been leaning towards when something is more family friendly. That's a whole other conversation mm -hmm. of whether that's like the right strategy. Um, but we, uh, we started looking for, um, presented events either that were already, um, built to be sensory friendly or, um, where that artist had a particular, um, uh, affinity for that work and might add a, uh, an additional performance, or where it just was like, that, like we did a, like a Muppet, Muppet sing-along with the Muppet movie event, and it happened to be on World Autism Day, um, and we contacted the artists and we were like, how do you feel about making this a relaxed performance? And they were totally excited about it, and now they've added that into their touring package that they can offer. Um, so, so that was a shift of just like what actually is the content and it also came to all the data we had of like we want a Saturday matinee <laughs> um, and how hard it is in terms of um, potential loss of, or the perception of how hard it is in terms of the potential loss of resources to give to, to uh, <laughs> I don't wanna say give dedicate. up. To dedicate <laughs> um, a to Saturday commit. matinee yeah. in your run. <laughs> yep. um, so that's partly why we moved to that model, however, Meanwhile, as all of this has been happening, in addition to the data of like we want a Saturday matinee, everybody says we want Christmas Carol every year. Um, and talk about a show where it's hard to dedicate um, a full performance in terms of revenue. Um, then, uh, and it was really great in terms of having like the posse have your back of, <laughs> of the cohort um, to be able to go say this is an issue, have, every, you know, have Marcy be able to say like we do it for our panto and that's our, that's our equivalent. Um, and other people sort of help brainstorm, et cetera. Then this year we had a really um, interesting thing happen um, where looking at Christmas Carol, hopefully for next year, I can't make promises on HowlRound, um, actually became a solution rather than this sort of white whale dream um, because we had chosen a presented event um, and the way that uh, it got budgeted and scheduled um, ended up being tricky. For, for the community that came, and we ended up having to kind of scramble at the last minute to get people in um, and shift our pricing structure, et cetera. We ended up with a pay what you can, which actually ended up averaging out to $15, which is what we should have priced it at to start with. Um, but uh, in, that, in that sort of scramble feeling, which is a feeling we really, we work really hard to avoid at McCarter, we really try to not be in a frantic space. Um, and that feeling, led us to, you know, all of a sudden we, we thought we were solving a problem by creating a special event for a relaxed performance, but it actually created some new problems. And boy, there's one show we do every year. <laughs> and, we, and we know the calendar way in advance, and it's family friendly. 
And there's a couple shows after Christmas that have lower uh, inventory. Um, and there's a matinee that's one of those shows. And like, boy, that show ticks a lot of boxes of all the data that we've been getting. Um, and so now we're, we're on the verge. It hasn't like, a, you know, it's not stamped and signed, um, but it's looking very likely that that will happen next year. So I just say that as like one of the takeaways of this process is sometimes the things that you think are out of reach, um, if you just sort of never let them go and keep them in the conversation, one day you might, uh, and this is for any community engagement thing, not just for live performances, you might be in a meeting where it's like, oh, we're having this huge problem. If only we had the solution. And this thing that you've been like waiting for the perfect moment can actually be the solution um, in that moment. Oh, yeah, that's me. OK. <laughs> um, other takeaways, advice, surprises. Um, consider the invitation. I, I would advise that. Consider what the invitation is, how your space, how individuals might be experiencing your space coming in, and thinking about this universe, as um, Erica mentioned, the marketing piece of this, the branding is huge for something like relaxed performances because it's not like marketing marketing that you, you know, send out the postcard, you have the mailing list already, folks are going to come and be excited. You're reaching a brand new audience who are not immediately trusting of your ability to serve their needs because there's no track record and because there's a deep amount of past harm that you need to make up for and prove you've done your homework. So a lot of this is actually one-to-one, -one, you know, and then tapping into those networks where people do um, have trust built and across our cohort, part of the, that huge priority was to establish a brand for the experience. Mm -hmm. If someone has come to People's Light and experienced our relaxed performance, they can be confident that when they visit PSF, Theater Horizon, McCarter, the rest of our partners, they are going to have an experience that feels it, it similarly welcome and that, that they have elements in place. And that's also part of the manifesto, but all, what all of us share in um, our promotional language and in the materials that we prepare in advance. So it is a different kind of marketing and that very easily can go into effect for um, many of our community engagement offerings, right? If we're reaching out to a community we haven't served, how are we tr building that trust and delivering on that from building and starting from one place and continuing to deliver on that promise? Um, also, um, finding your allies, your advocates, your partners across the organization. Um, Finding your posse, as Erica said, it's you know you're, it can be in various departments of the organization, um, board, volunteers, board members who may not be able, interested in coming, not know what's happening. Invite them to volunteer. Invite them to be engaged. As Megan said, getting folks in the room is so so important. But drawing on people's individual expertise and perspectives in a lot of different ways, um, it, it does need to kind of come across the organization. And finding who are your anchor partners. We know that it's essential to have multiple cultural programming opportunities. So it's not you on your own as an institution who has your occupational therapist, who has your whomever else um, that you're working with. If you're doing one performance a year, someone's not free on that day, you're not serving that population in a meaningful way. And what we were able to do is create a season of this work across our organizations. It was really intentional that we wanted to do that. So there are multiple offerings. Somebody might not like a, a panto, a Christmas carol, any number of one offering that we have, but with multiple ways in, it's the way anyone can opt, opt in for, for the content that's most interesting and compelling to them. Um, other anchor partners can include um, who, who are the experts that you need, social workers, occupational therapists, um, special education teachers, um, uh, school partners. Having a school partner was really significant um, throughout our work within the cohort um, for people's light anyway and just considering what does this constellation of support look like for you um, and the needs of your organization. And I, I would also mention that it, it kind of, it, there's an intentionality to that and there's also as it begins to happen the momentum just goes and we experience that people's light, I mean maybe it was a four month period after or less than that after the first relaxed performance we did it like it just kind of catches fire and as you have the right people in the room to continue to proliferate that message to others it I'm, I'm encouraging folks to be intentional across the organization but it also kind of organically just happened at people's life that we had folks in production folks in development folks in all different walks across seniority across um, age experience level department who are deeply bought in and you can't have experiences like these, a relaxed performance kind of experience, um, and it doesn't change the culture and temperature of your organization. And that was something for us that as a, a really meaningful surprise and sharing is that you, it, I hope with a lot of our work, you, you have new eyes 
and that you see the world in a whole different way that allows you to question all other aspects you thought you knew about your organization. Who is intentionally invited? Who is included? Who might feel excluded intentionally or unintentionally? And, right? and so how can we begin to investigate all other facets of our programming and, and consider that, um, that invitation? I also, um, I also wanted to mention that it's, um, are we here yet? Yeah, so there's, um, we have experienced in the community in the Philadelphia region after, um, I, I don't know, Philadelphia was kind of catching up to some other quadrants of the world that have been on this work. Um, but now there's been a 600% increase in relaxed performances over a two year period from before we were gathered as an official cohort to the years that we were working together, and it's only ramping up and growing from there. It's not just us. Now the Philadelphia, the ballet, got on board and wanted us to consult with them and share our learnings, which we are eager to do, right? As you do it, you want people to do this. Philadelphia Ballet, the orchestra, um, Philadelphia Theater Company, others in our region are now taking this on as well and aligning and, and developing their own levels of partnership too. So, um, oh yeah, and it's income generating. It can be, you know, this work can be, you know, the first time, maybe probably not, there's a lot of investment. But that it's, a mis, um, it's a misconception to think that all of this is complete charity and that there aren't ways to leverage this. You can scale it up. And it takes having the right people with you to do it and being rigorous about um, your intentions and evaluation and using that to your advantage. But um, yeah, it can be income generating too. And bouncing off of what Marcy said about sort of seeing things through a new lens, one of our biggest takeaways, which shouldn't have been a surprise, but when the work is more welcoming, it makes the work better. <laughs> it's not, it, that's not a hard concept, but it takes going through it, I think, for us to have fully realized it. One of our small success stories is uh, one of our fears going into the project was that we're an equity professional theater, but the performance that we chose and the show that we chose is performed by our young company who are college students at our partner university. And so I had just self-consciousness about, can these, are these students able to adapt in the moment? Or do they have the life experience and the professional experience to be able to handle an audience that might be um, something they're not familiar with? and to trust that our audience would be um, taken care of and protected in our space. And they, they went so above and beyond what I could have imagined. When Roger came to consult with us, they were offering things that they could adjust or things thoughts that they had on their own performances. We had a lot of live music, so they instituted for that relaxed performance a little um, intro session to all their musical instruments so that everyone felt comfortable with what they were about to hear and knew that that drum was gonna make that sound and this guitar was gonna make that sound. And they loved it so much that they did it the rest of the run. So there were 40 <laughs> more performances where they were like, this is a blast. The kids are loving it. We're going to make our work better by instituting what we just did to make the work more welcoming to everybody. And those are the kinds of things you, I couldn't have anticipated. But it does just make, when everybody's on point like that, it makes the work better mm -hmm. and more welcoming for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and there is no one way to, um, to do the work. Um, we have, have created a, um, a sort of best practices and or model for how we, or basic model for these are the sorts of things that, we're, that we have been doing at our theaters. But um, there was um, one thing that, that you mentioned actually, like, uh, like ASL clapping as opposed mm -hmm. to um, normal clapping. I haven't done that. We, I don't think we've done that at our theater. Yeah. And that, I think that's absolutely wonderful. So there, there are definitely lots of um, ways that you can um, go about um, making adjustments, the the it's really more about what the, what questions you're asking and knowing and and knowing what your goal is and, and keeping um, and asking questions to to drive you towards that goal. Um, so, for example, at at Theater Horizon, our um, the, sh the our first Brex relaxed performance was a was within a show that was very different than um, the other uh, productions that, that were happening that year. Um, it was a uh, devised children's show um, that, uh, that um, allowed the audience to travel throughout our theater space in many different environments. Um, and so it wasn't a, the, the, the whole, oh, well, we have to um, um, set d seats on either side because there were no seats. Um, and so it's, um, and there <laughs> are so, stimulus. Yes, and, and the sensory <laughs> stimulus for that particular show was intense because it was completely immersive as opposed to one where you're on, you're very much actually separated from the stage. So um, even though ours was very different, um, we still took many of the, um, 
the practices um, that you generally see at a relaxed performance, such as um, an usher with a blue um, glow stick that sits in the audience that alerts anyone to um, anything that's coming up. We still had our blue glow stick, um, but it was with an usher that was traveling along with the, <laughs> um, uh, with the audience. So, um, but it's, again, it's about the questions that you ask, and if your goal is inclusion, then looking at it from that standpoint as opposed to, well, these are the things that we need mm. to check off so that we make it relaxed. Um, it's, 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 it's a lot more about who, what is the community that we're serving and what is the thing that we're trying to make um, accessible to them and how do, we, um, um, how do we bridge that gap. So we're happy to take some questions at this point. We really wanted to pull it in. We have two minutes for questions. So wow, your timing was so good. Yeah, yesterday, so that's what her outline said. Need a minute for certain <laughs> sessions for one minute at a time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And we had, it's on there, two minutes for questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you, you talked about things that shouldn't have been a surprise, like that it improved the quality yeah. of the performance and that it actually changed the trajectory of mm -hmm. productions and performances. Mm -hmm. Have you found anecdotally that there are people who do not necessarily need the benefit of a relaxed performance, but they become supporters of the relaxed performance yeah. model and actually prefer coming to those performances versus standard Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, varying our definition of who needs a relaxed performance, we a large part of our audience for our first year was actually young mothers who maybe had a five-year-old that it was a, a easier to bring a five-year-old to a, a performance, but also had a one and a half year old or one year, like an infant that they were scared of disrupting the rest of the audience. So a relaxed performance is essential for that young mom. Or we had a birthday party and we explained what a relaxed performance was and they said, that sounds perfect for a birthday party. Mm -hmm. it, and, <laughs> we had and the yeah, same thing. Yeah. 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 So it yeah, it, it, it expands and and moves as as it needs to, depending on the follow up on that. Um, handyman, have you used the standards? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> yes. Now we have, we've got water bowls in our lobbies, we have mm -hmm. mats that we invite, and you know, having a special designated doggy business area. Get a sign and tell people where is it safe area. for your animal to go. But I mean, we, it, it's, you're, you're not allowed to, like it's illegal to exclude anyone and you know, on the basis of any kind of need, but for service animals, like our institution has been welcoming of, of service animals, but it hasn't been an overt invitation, mm -hmm. right? And so now it's like, come on, how do we let people know this is a celebration? And it's not even, Part of it is for the individual who, who um, has the service, but it's also about general audience awareness and education, right? So putting the signage out, making things visible. So it's like, oh, right, we all have a range of different needs. How can we be more understanding and inclusive? Yes, yes. please. And in, in terms of people coming, um, like supporters coming back, uh, another group that we've noticed is our ushers, and that uh, a fear that we had early on is like, oh, will we get enough volunteers for this? Will people want to do this? Mm -hmm. It's the first one to fill up every year. People say it's their favorite thing to usher. It's their favorite volunteer opportunity at the theater. And that goes across our staff, too. Staff dive into volunteer. They're like, oh, no, no, when, when is that? Can mm -hmm. I make sure? It's like we, we don't need all. It's amazing to have all the bodies, but we don't need all of the mm -hmm. bodies that show up to do an actual job. They stand there and have the smiling face, and that's what we've learned as um, feedback from audience members is the first thing what matters most to them is how they're welcomed into the space, right? So it is that smile. And we have families walk in and just break down mm. from the smile. It's like, I, to know that this was for me and that I'm well is amazing. We have zero minutes left. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> but we're around, obviously. But we're around. So we're and here. we're, yeah. Thanks for Thank being you. here. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> Take it short. Take it short. Take it short. Take it short.